Hello, I'm Steve Leach, director of Dartmouth-Hitchcock's Norris Cotton Cancer Center, and I'd like to welcome you to our annual Telling Our Stories in Word and Images event. Telling Our Story celebrates our wonderful Cancer Center Creative Arts Program and is sponsored by our Cancer Center and by DH Arts. This year's event is notable in that it is our 10th annual showcasing of patient and caregiver creative writing, song, and visual art. And like everything else in this pandemic year, this year's event is like no other, videotaped rather than live and in person, but still celebrating that sense of community and narrative and meaning that bind us all together in good times and bad. We are truly privileged to offer a unique arts program here at Norris Cotton. Our talented resident artists, Marv Klassen Landis, Kim Hall, and Margaret Stevens, guide patients to express themselves in extraordinary ways. In the face of COVID-19, the program currently consists of virtual sessions with a visual artist, a creative writer, or a therapeutic harpist. And I again want to acknowledge the incredible leadership of Andrea Bucolato and congratulate her on finding ways to so effectively deliver our rem remarkable patient and family support services, even in these pandemic times. The Creative Arts Program is generously supported by the Friends of the Norris Cotton Cancer Center, the Gertrude H. Mertens Fund, the Hypertherm Hope Foundation, and many additional donors who make creative arts expression possible for our patients and their families. I also want to take this moment to acknowledge those that we have lost during the past year and to feel their presence as we enjoy this evening's readings and performances. Among them, I want to specifically mention Ben Shore. Ben was an early, early visionary to this very creative arts program and deeply understood the healing power of the arts. We are grateful to Ben and his loved ones for this lasting legacy. Thank you for joining us uh, this evening. I truly hope that you'll enjoy this wonderful event. Hello, I am Marv Klassen Landis. Telling our stories through word and image celebrates artwork, poetry, stories, and songs created by patients, supporters, employees, and volunteers. We find that self-expression in the arts helps us better understand who we are. Especially important in times of suffering, the arts can help us through creative exploration. When we share our creations with others, we strengthen community. We thank Norris Cotton Cancer Center Director Stephen Leach for his deep understanding of and support for the role of the arts in healing. A huge thanks to all who agreed to share their words and art and music for this program. And to all who view this program, thank you for helping us complete the circle. A writing circle holds our energy as we move through writing together in separate worlds. We share a connection to the Cotton Cancer Center, which forms the first strand of our web. As we write, share, laugh, find our voices, we are writers circling together. We explore our interior worlds and support one another. As writers, we are vulnerable the circle acknowledges that vulnerability and challenges us to write anyway. We write our thoughts and experiences to share aloud or bear witness silently. Our circle sends ripples from our center to the larger world. We are here, we have something to say.
I would like to fold this field into a tiny square and keep it in my pocket. This is what memories are, I suppose. This one I would open slowly to reveal the well-worn creases from years of repeated use. The patches of wildflowers, no less vibrant for time, will never die. I would like to dip my face close to smell the earth and greet the beetles. I would like to spread the square on the ground like a miniature picnic blanket and place my foot where I can feel the grass. Sometimes I would like to fold myself within this field into its tiny square and tuck myself away in my pocket. happens when you gather a circle of writers. Individual words, individual rhythm, individual spice, individual memories become a tale told together. We dig into our thoughts and lay them out for others like peddlers on the street selling our wares. We spoon a nourishing stew into each other's hearts, word by fortifying word. We drape stories, knit together, across each other's shoulders, like a communal prayer shawl circling the lot of us. The writing circle spins like a merry-go-round. It throws you off you can jump back on. You can't help but notice the changes, the remix. Everyone is either pushing or riding, boosting the speed or pointing out the sights streaming by. What can you capture in the whirlwind? What can open up for you? Combinations unknown before. Even the birds and clouds have a different spin. The rain, the fiesta, a new blend of words, new recipes, the news, last week's checkup with the doc, swirling memories, the texture of now, the future beckoning. What's to become of me, my old neighbor said. This scared me. She'd always been my rock. She taught me most of what I know. At least, I feel that's so. Now I don't know what to hold on to. That's not really fair. Why should she be the rock? So that's what I'll hold on to. A letting go. You may encounter rain. You might be a greenskeeper mowing the golf course, watching the rain drip off your hat. You might be a reporter, beating feet down the street, chasing a story in the rain. You might be a state trooper, sweeping glass off the wet road. You may be caught in the rain and accused of not having enough sense to come in out of it. But you do come in when you're ready, and dry off and change your socks and feel pretty good about it. The rain taps me on the shoulder. It says, hey, I'm trying to get your attention here, hoping for a bit of your early afternoon, but you keep ignoring me, snob that you are. What do I have to do to impress upon you the seriousness of the situation? What thunder do I have to unleash so as to free you from that mental trampoline, that monkey mind that has you bouncing up and down between regretted past and fearful future? Sure, I can soak your shoes, your socks, but what does it matter if you keep scurrying down the desert byways, that dry center of your heart parched as sandpaper? I splash myself on you, shattering into a million bits of prism. And every time I do, I let the light pass through 
until the sky gets dizzy looking down at all this rainbow strobing. I'm trying to make a point here. I'm trying to tell you that this inattention of yours, this obliviousness to the obvious wet zone in which I've enveloped you is both cause and symptom of your current malaise. When was the last time you saw a bird fly through me, heard a cricket announce its regal news, or a dog shake my syllables off from under its hair? I'll keep on about this until you figure it out. I'll keep on about it until I see you looking up to see what's happening here. Who was it said the weight of the world is love? That's what I keep trying to tell you. And when I tap your shoulder, that's when I hope you understand it's your own thirst that has you turning away. It begins as half a conversation. The page is frayed and stained with half moons of coffee or tea, brittle with age, though how old could they be? These words dated only by the bookends of your literacy and your death. Blue cursive runs smooth across the page, wind speed and hymn of which you were always such a master. Take, for instance, the way you'd fashion the word O oh in your own odes to spectacular thought. O, oh, I hear you say, I do love sentences that begin with O. Oh. And that might be O, oh, Susanna, or O, oh, had I a golden thread, or O, oh, the cool, cool swirl of this morning stream as it flows through our hot summer sun. Such revelation was always there beside you, as pen in hand you plucked thoughts like bursting grapes. You are here now as I read you here, sentences filled with your breath, sails set against that color I remember in your eyes, pages always happy to be turned. acrylic paint Nothing feels so fine as acrylic paint Nothing cuts the pain Nothing fights the shame like acrylic paint Nothing in this world Nothing I prefer to acrylic paint
When you have cancer, you get that as your moniker or your brand, right? Among your peers and coworkers. The next person to get cancer is encouraged to go talk to you. So I've decided, since this has happened to me so many times, to just write down once and for all the advice I give the most frequently because it is the worst and we need to help each other with the worst. it and everything. You are in a fight for your life and your sanity. If there is some bull going down at the job, mm, that job. If there is drama in the house because of your kids, mm, them kids, you have cancer. And you are officially allowed not to give a mm. This is super hard for moms, especially, who give and give and give. But listen here, you're about to be microwaved, bald, bloated, and green. There ain't nothing that can't wait. Repeat that to yourself often. There is nothing that can't wait. I straight up matched this shirt when I was sick. Do you think I cared about anything? Next piece of advice. Do what works until it doesn't. Today you want a bagel. Yesterday you had a bagel. Tomorrow, a bagel will turn your stomach. You now want potato chips. They are the only thing that you can manage. If anybody offers you another cup of herbal tea, you will slap them. You want honey whiskey. Do it. You want the heated blanket and the heating pad and the heat cranked up and it's August? Do it. You want to watch some reality TV or The Young and the Restless? Do it. You have a PhD and that's really not your thing or whatever? Do it. I suggest uh, Love After Lockup and Dance Moms for some seriously screwed up human dramas. When I was on Taxol, I couldn't eat anything. I lost 23 pounds. I laid in the bed day after day after day, just on one side, looking with the corner of my eye out of a small corner of a window. I didn't change my clothes. I didn't bathe. I got up to go to the bathroom once in a while because I was dehydrated. And then I went back to the hospital for more of the same. Somebody, eventually, somebody sent me a dinner of roasted chicken, potato salad, and other picnic-y items from a deli. And I could taste for the first time in months. I ate that every day for two weeks. It had to only be from that store. Noticing a theme? Cancer is your life out of control. Just recognizing that will help you when you throw out the get well cards sent by people you normally care about and enjoy, when you refuse to come to the phone or never respond to emails. You have cancer. Nothing else matters and you don't have to care about anybody else at all right now. That's not cruelty, it's essential. It's survival. People talk to you and stuff happens and you can't follow the thread. Why? You're afraid for your life, that's why. You do not give one good goddamn about somebody's new deck, the kid getting into law school, or who had a baby. You have cancer. I am a highly religious person. When I had cancer, I forgot all the words of the Lord's Prayer. The last thing I will say is that once you're diagnosed, you're in a fog. You immediately um, get set up for a series of appointments and meetings like you're a passenger booked on a flight, somebody else arranged. You get on the cancer train and it's a treadmill of driving to the hospital, going here, then there, then someplace else. There isn't any time to adjust and process and digest. You are too busy trying not to puke on the floor. When it's all over, if you're lucky enough to survive, you will look back and be amazed. Then, and only then, you will start to grieve. If you lose people you know started at the same time as you, it will terrify you. You will need to grieve and talk with people who have been there and come out on the other side. It sucks. 
There's no two ways about it. It sucks. So you do you however you need to. And if anybody tries to tell you different, you call your crew and get them to set those folks straight. Don't have a crew? Call me. And I will slap some sense into them for you. Pour us both a drink and call it a damn day. Swallowtail flutters, seeking blossoms, sweet nectar, at my father's grave. Late sun on the pond, shimmering, sparkled, dappling through the twittering leaves. A silver liquid drop plops on my shiny pate where silver hair no longer grows. What happens to a dream deferred? Does it stink like rotten meat? Langston Hughes. A dream deferred stinks. Yeah, it stinks. But I have no idea how bad it stinks. All the things I thought I knew, but I don't. Fear in the streets? No. Dog off a leash? No. Knee in the neck? No. 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 So much to uncover and recover. What do I know of a dream deferred? Nothing. Do I notice the color of your skin? You bet I do. I'm speechless. I'm hopeless. Not blameless. Forgive me. Fear flows to panic flows to haste, flows to regret, flows to remorse, flows to longing, flows to amends, flows to forgiveness, flows to faith. One, when the diagnosis came, my vision instantly sharpened as if I had given a good scrub to my glasses. On the way home, the icy trees on Route 4 gleamed, the sun filtering through pine branches with newfound light, the field stretched ahead, covered in impossible whites and grays that blended with the sky. I sat in our frozen garden, stunned. Not one to look for signals, I nevertheless followed some tracks on the snow and found a fox staring at me in the driveway. I let him lead me up the hill, taking me home. Two, snow is falling, so is my hair. First, small flurries of white and brown, and then a northeaster of fur that calls for immediate shaving. This loss is not a surprise. It was forecasted in a brochure tenderly entitled Chemotherapy and You, as if chemo and I needed relationship advice. Along with the fear, there is room for curiosity about this body now turned into battlefield. I envision my heroes, chemo molecules as red-jacketed soldiers, 
immature neutrophils as baby face recruits chasing a tyrant on a snow covered ground. I don't dare or don't care to give a face to cancer. As I leave the hospital, a waft of warm, moist air assures me that the spring will be here soon, bringing life again to barren fields. Three, for the first time in months, I'm strong enough to climb the hill above our home. It's Sunday and tomorrow I will be in surgery. Spring is in its fluorescent green stage. New maple leaves like dots unfurling, young grass on the path untouched, moss seeping water on the stone wall. And at the top, the grassy knoll with distant views of a ski slope still sporting patches of white. I sit and rest, feeling the weight of anxiety and the pulse of hope, like my heart running fast. If I were one to pray, this would be the time. But trotting the steps on the forest behind me interrupt my silence. For a moment, I believe it's my dog, but she's old and fading fast asleep at home. Instead, a fox stands before me, looks me in the eye and jumps away. This is a song that I wrote for my son, Zach, and it's called Bullfrog.
This is At the Cancer Center, written by the staff of 3K. Sometimes we speak with tears, sometimes with laughter. Tears of joy, tears of sorrow. Some so damaged, no medicine can save. 40 patients to go and access. Tears of joy, tears of sorrow. Blessed beyond measure to be part of love. 40 patients to go in access. Daryl was our shining star. Blessed beyond measure to be part of love. I got a scooch back to the suite. Daryl was our shining star. Angels of the Cancer Center. I got a scooch back to the suite. I'm scooching back to joy. Angels of the Cancer Center. We celebrate healing, we mourn our losses. I'm scooching back to joy. Some so damaged, no medicine can save. We celebrate healing, we mourn our losses. Sometimes we speak with tears, sometimes with laughter. There once was a fella named Tim who wrote limericks when inspiration struck him. But as his imagination went dry, it seemed to imply his muse only appeared on a whim. It's too bad that my spine has this cancer, but worrying is not the right answer, as everyone can evidently see, and I must wholeheartedly agree, even before this tumor, I was a horrible dancer. Many years we have fought the scourge of cancer together. Many nights, days, and hours, cancer has gripped our lives, and for a normal life, we strive. For many months now, we have been in remission. Through God's good graces, we seem to have won one of life's most serious races. Now we have another one of life's real serious tests. The coronavirus, it's made our lives a mess. Where did it come from and why is it here? It is a, to remind us of the ultimate fear? No, I think it is to ground us and embrace our loved ones both far and near. We will overcome and persevere and there will be a reason to cheer. All these are a serious test and we as humans are the best at beating all the odds. And we will turn to our respective gods for calm and peace, and soon our fears will cease. Twinkle, winkle, COVID, ha. 
You can't tell who we are. Mask to cover nose and mouth does not work if you see my snout. You wreck havoc near and far. I feel safest in my car. Changing patterns in our days. No, I can't come out and play. Deep within the forest green, I alone, no mask on me. Shopping local, good for all. I can still make quite a haul. If I keep the mask upon my face, I'll live to see the vaccine race. This spring, I'm aware of sounds. I celebrate the trill of a cardinal, call of robins, coo of doves at sunset, steady hum of bees swaying the pink tufts of my Russian oregano. Paul Revere's bell chimes the hour, skateboards and bicycles whiz down the hill midweek. Rain drums a primitive rhythm on my metal roof. Drone of a dart helicopter overhead reminds me it's a pandemic. The rush of wind cannot be seen, only felt. A powerful force shaping rock and water. The silent gaze I offer to you 
is not felt in mind or matter, but in the shared space of souls who've stopped their rushing. A powerful force shapes emotion and experience. You are seen, you are known, you are held. All communicated in the stillness of my eyes upon yours. Pandora's box had a lid, keeping the chaos contained. So often I search for containers to organize the chaos of my thoughts, of grief, of pain that I see and experience. A place to put it away and close it up tight, only to be examined when the lid is about to pop off. But joy, the bubbling up of excitement mixed with happiness and awe, joy is like an uncorked champagne bottle shared in the company of all I hold dear. Joy won't fit in my boxes. Instead, joy pulls me out of my confinement, past the boundaries which keep me steady and upright. It pushes me up the hill just to knock me over and send me rolling down in a fit of freedom and delight. I will love to live by the water. The sound calms my body. Whenever I see a fountain, I sit next to it and I'm taken to another place where only the sound of water knows the way. I once had a dream that I went to heaven. I was dressed in white, playing with the waves of this beautiful large body of water. It sparkled like liquid diamonds. The waves played with me they were alive, full of joy, as I too was overjoyed like a child who for the first time played with the waves of the seas. After her long drive home over mountains to the sea, her dad films her, sends it to me, pushing the toy shopping cart I gave her with only a diaper for clothes. She announces to dolls, to corridor walls, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. A presence I hear ringing so loudly here among towering hemlocks, I look to see who's speaking. Not the crow overhead, nor snow hills, nor limb breaking in wind, this ringing I hear buying groceries from a masked cashier as I pass friends entering as I exit, all of us hurrying to somewhere else. The ringing I hear looking into my wife's eyes as I serve her coffee. I realize the one singing, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, is me.